we're done with here shortly. In John chapter 15, beginning at verse number 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husband. And every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can he, except he abide in me. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Verse number 1 and 2 say, I am the true vine, my Father is the husband, and every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purchaseth, that it might bring forth more fruits. John chapter 15 is a, a very unique chapter because it gives us a beautiful example of the relationship between Jesus and us. It says that he is the true vine and that we are the branches. If you study out all this stuff, and, and I don't pretend to be one that knows everything about uh, uh, plants. My dad does. If you know my dad, he's a plant guy. But uh, if one thing you know about vines and things is the vine... Every vine has one main stem, which is the vine. The vine is what connects the roots to the branches. The roots gather the food for the plant, which is moved from the roots to the vine, and then dispersed from the vine to the branches. So in other words, the vine, it, once it, once, because it connects the roots to the branches, it ends up being the life source. It ends up being everything that we need. Just the same thing that Jesus is. We sing a song that Jesus, you are the center of my joy. Everything that we do revolves around the vine. Everything that we do in our life revolves around the vine. So if we're going to get the food that we need spiritually, we need to be connected to the vine. The vine is the life source. And if we are not connected to it, then we will not get the nourishment that we need. So how are we connected in the mind? The Bible says that every one of us is a part of the body of Jesus Christ. The Bible records that we should not neglect the assembly of ourselves together. In other words, that if we are going to stay connected to the vine, first off, you need to find a place that you can worship in. A place that, that teaches and preaches the truth. A place that the Spirit of God is moving in a mighty way. Because that's how we get connected to the vine. You have to find and have a relationship with a pastor. The pastor role is very biblical. Uh, in the, especially in the Old Testament, it talks about how the, the pastor is the shepherd of the church. And as God speaks to the pastor, God speaks to the man of God, then the man of God can in turn relay information and relay what God wants said to the people. So if we're going to get connected to what Jesus wants in this day, you first need to find a place of worship. Secondly, you need to find a man of God that you can connect with, that you can, uh, that you know that they are hearing from God and they are going to feed you. But more importantly than those other ones, not that those are important, because you can have the best church and you can have the best pastor in the world. But more importantly than that is you need to have a personal relationship with God. Because you're only in church a few, four, maybe four or five hours a week. We have Sunday school at 11 o'clock. We have an evangelistic service at 12. Depending on how long or how short I decide to preach, we are out of here by 1, 1.30, depending on the altar service. We have Tuesday prayer that we pray for 45 minutes to an hour. And we have our Thursday night Bible study from 7.30, and we get done between 8.30 and 9 o'clock, depending on how long the teaching goes. So you're in church, really, four to five hours a week. In our relationship, and the only time that we are connected to the mind, and the only time we're connected is those three times a week that we come to church, Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, then you're not getting all the nutrients and all the nourishment that you need. And I'm not saying that you have to go to a church that has a church on Monday and go to a church that has a church on Wednesday and a church that has a church on Friday, but we need to have something that we can fall back on on our own, our own personal walk with God. 
So when we wake up in the morning, we should be finding a place of prayer and getting our day started being connected to the mind. We need to, throughout the day, when the Bible talks about praying without ceasing, all throughout the day, we should have our mind focused in on God. And yeah, we've got to do work and we've got other things we have to do. But even throughout my day, there are quick moments where I get in my mind, I just say a quick prayer, God help me, or God whatever I need from, from God at that moment. Throughout the day, we need to find time to read and study the Word of God. It's so vitally important because we hear the Word two different ways. One is through the spoken Word. You come to church, you hear somebody speak the Word. But another way that you learn the Word of God is through reading the Word of God. If we want to know what the Bible says, we can come to church and you hear good teaching and you hear good preaching, and that's great. But then once again, that's only four or five hours a week that you're connected to God. But what about the other 24 hours a day, those other five days a week or four days a week that we are not in church? It's so important that we spend a few moments in prayer every single day. And I'm not saying that for those of us that haven't or aren't praying every day, that you need to start praying an hour or two every day. But maybe if you're not praying, what if we could just say, God, I'm going to connect and give you 10 minutes of undivided attention. I'm going to do, when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to give you five minutes. And before I go to bed, I'm going to give you five minutes. That's five, that's ten more minutes a day that we are connecting to the mind. We're connecting to the life source. We can get nourishment and spiritual food and spiritual uplifting. If you're, if you're not reading the Bible, what if you could just read one chapter a day? And if you really don't like to read, if you go through the book of Psalms, there are a lot of chapters that have three and four and five verses. So if you don't like to read, I'm, I'm not a big fan of reading. I'm just not. I don't like to read. But if I, if I want to get a quick fix, if I want to get a drive through Happy Meal of what God wants for me that day, I can go through the book of Psalms and I can get four or five or six verses, enough that takes me a couple minutes to read. And I'm like, man, I feel good about that. That was a quick shot in the arm. That was the chicken nuggets I needed to get me through the next couple of hours of my day. But if you are if you are already reading four or five, six verses a day, what if we could just go and read a chapter or two a day? What if you're reading a chapter or two a day? Why not go to four or five a day? Why not try to read the Bible in a year? There's programs you can get off the internet that says if you read X amount of chapters a day, you read these chapters that you will read the Bible through in a year. My wife has a Bible that is chronologically ordered. It tells you on this day you read until the day is over, and then it says the next day. It's great. She's done that how many years? A lot. Now, ever since we've been married before that, for probably close to 10 years, that she has been reading the Bible through every single year. It's great, because every time you do that, that God is pouring in more wisdom and pouring in more knowledge, and you can feel strength begin to build up in you. What about when you're not reading and you're not praying? What about the stuff that we listen to on the radio? Because sometimes when I get in my car, I've got a Marvin Sat CD in my car right now. And so I was listening to it the last couple of days, and when I'm having a really hard day, I try to find something that's going to be uplifting. There's times in, the, in my car where I can turn on a gospel CD, or I can turn on a Christian radio station, and then a song will come on that will begin to minister to me, and I can feel connected to the mind. I can feel like, like God is literally speaking through those speakers, and talking right to me, and giving me the words of encouragement that I need for that moment and for that time. We have to be connected to the mind. We have to be connected. He goes on to say that my father is the husbandman. So what role does the husbandman play in the mind? After a vine is planted, the vine dresser or the husbandman has two duties. His first duty is to cut off the fruitless branches which take away the sap from fruit-bearing branches. Because if sap is wasted, then the plant will bear less fruit. So how do branches die? Branches die is very simple. They die when there is a disconnect between the branches and the vine. Right where the branch meets the vine, there are pores that allow sap to pass through. When plants die, the pores close. 
which won't allow any of the juices from the stem to make it to the branch, thus causing it to be dead, which it will not allow it to bear fruit. So the vine carries its nutrients. Where the branches meet the vine, there's little pores. As long as the pores are alive and as long as they're open, the branch can receive nutrients and, and receive nourishment. But when the, when the pores begin to close and the sap builds up, then even though the vine is trying everything that it can to get nutrients into that branch, it's not going to happen because the branch pores have closed itself and the sap makes a, a hard lining where nothing can get through to it. One of the quickest ways to create a dead branch spiritually is sin. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 John chapter 2, 15 and 16 say it this way. He said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, then the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. One of the quickest ways for a branch, for one of us to die spiritually, is to allow sin to creep into our lives. That's why Paul says in the New Testament that we need to die daily and we need to mortify the deeds of the flesh. Mortify meaning to kill. Every day that we wake up, if we are not connected, if we do not pray, if we do not read the Word of God, if we are not singing praises or listening to uh, music that is going to uplift our spirit, then on Monday when you leave, or on Sunday when you leave church and you decide not to connect yourself the rest of Sunday and on Monday, then guess what happens spiritually to your branch? The pores begin to close themselves up. And then your heart begins to be hardened. And then even though God is trying to pour blessings into your life, and He's trying to speak life into the mind, God can only do so much. He can only do what you allow Him to do. He, yeah, we know that God can do anything, but if you're not willing to let the pores open, and if you're not willing to let God move in your life, then you can sever the relationship that you have with God. And even though it's God's will to give you blessings, and it's God's will to uplift you, and it's God's will to encourage you, and it's God's will to strengthen you, He can't do it if you're not allowing the pores to be open. That's why when we leave church on Sunday, we're here for just a few hours on a Sunday. And the, one of the reasons why we designed this Sunday afternoon slash morning service is so in the afternoon and evening that we could fellowship and be a blessing one to another and maybe have a Bible study or two or do something to uplift and encourage one another. It's something that we can do to help keep the pores open so that God can keep filtering life into the branches. But if, we, if we're not careful, then what happens is this. We leave Sunday, we have a rapid service. You feel good, you feel great, and the weight of the world is off your shoulders, and you feel like you can fly. And then Sunday night rolls around, and Monday you have a bad day at work, and things begin to fall apart, and Tuesday comes, and you think, well, we only pray for an hour on Tuesday, so it's not worth the drive to get there. And so Tuesday comes, and while everybody else is here praying, which, by the way, Tuesday night was phenomenal. We had a great crowd, great, powerful move of God in our prayer meeting. So thank you for coming on Tuesday. But what happens is, well, I don't know why, I'm going to go on a tangent here for a minute, but prayer is one of the most important services that we have. Tuesday night prayer meeting is so vitally important because for that few moments, for that 45 minutes to an hour, it allows us to get into a place where we can open ourselves up to God and be transparent before God and say, God, whatever I've done, it gives you a chance to repent of your sins. It gives you a chance to feel the prayers of your brothers and sisters as they are praying, as they're feeling deliverance, as they're feeling joy come into them. And then that gets transferred onto you. And while you're in the middle of your trial, and while you're in the middle of despair, you can hear somebody praying and getting the victory. You can hear somebody praying for you and calling out your name and saying, God, help Sister Pauline. And while you're up there, you hear somebody praying for you. Man, that lets the pores open up just that much more. And say, God, would you fill me one more time? Would you encourage me one more time? So that's my tangent on prayer meeting. But what happens if you begin to neglect prayer meeting? The first service.
spend your time. If you want to find out what you love, follow where your money goes and follow where you spend your time. We can say that we love God and we can say, oh, I'm a Christian and all this stuff, but if we break down the time element of our week and of our day, some of us would be lucky to say that we spend more than five minutes a day in the presence of God. But we can spend hours in front of our social media, and hours in front of a computer, and hours in front of a TV, and hours doing this, that, and the other thing. Hours hanging out with our friends. We're hanging out with friends isn't bad. But there comes a time where you need to cut some stuff off and say, that's not helping me in my relationship with God. That's not uh, keeping my pores open. But, and you know, sometimes you just got to cut some people off. There are people I don't hang out with anymore, and I don't socialize with anymore. Not that they're bad people, but when I get with them, there's just nothing prosperous that happens. So I have to cut some people out of my life so I can stay connected to the life source. If we are not careful, the little things will creep up. Little mini gods will come up in our life. And he said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The reason why that is, is as long as God is God, and as long as God is number one in your life, then you'll always have a good connection. As long as you have a good connection, it will always bring life to you. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21 says, These are the works of the flesh of manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, various, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, and revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. All that list, and that's just not even the whole list, because he said, and such like. There's too many things to name in a portion of scripture. But he said, if you allow sin to creep into your life, that you are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. We have to get sin out of our life. There's sins mentioned. It's what I just read that some of us battle with on a daily basis. There's a war that goes on inside of us. When we wake up in the morning, we fight flesh. All throughout the day, we fight our flesh. When we go to sleep at night, we fight our flesh. Sometimes we dream things that you have no control over. But if you're connected to the mind, then maybe you won't dream those types of dreams. But because of the sin that we battle, it is hard to keep the sin under control. But, but we have to learn to contain it and control it because that's how we get our precious nourishment from the mind. So we've got to make sure that we get away from the sin, run from the sin, turn away from the sin, and then reestablish a connection with God. The husbandman is to cut off the branches that aren't bearing fruit because it hurts the branches that are bearing fruit. One thing I've learned from my dad is when he goes out to a plant, when by the time he's done, it, it looks terrible. That plant looks bad. If you ever drive by my parents' house, right about, uh, give it a couple of weeks, they got a couple of trees in their front yard that when you go by in a couple of weeks, it's going to look disgusting, terrible. Because he just hacks away at it. And breaks his chopping here and there and everywhere. It's got to be this, it's pruning this. And you have rose bushes and things like that. You know, I don't do yard work at our house. I feel bad, but my wife does most of that. Or all of it, let's say. I mow the yard, and that's about it. But, you know, she'll go through and she'll find dead stuff and cut them off. Because the dead things that are there just waste energy. So we've got to be careful. If the husbandman cuts off the branches that aren't bearing the fruit because it hurts the branches that are. I'm not just talking about those that sin, but he was talking to his disciples. You know, we talk about sin being a separation, but Jesus wasn't just talking about sinners. He was talking about people that go to church. He was talking about people that dwell with him on a daily basis. He knew that one of them, that 11 of these people were good. They were great men. They were going to lead hundreds and thousands of people to God. They were going to turn their world upside down. But he knew that one, one person, Judas, was going to be a dead spot. He knew that one person, that if he was not cut off, that everything else was going to go bad. There's going to be people in church that, you know, you may not have the problems with drugs and alcohol, but, but we're dead branches because of our attitudes and our actions. There's going to be people that sit in our church that have no problem with outward sin, but 
inside. The Bible says that we can be full of dead man's bones because of attitudes and things and personalities that 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 will come in and cut off from the mind. People that judge everybody, that battle the spirit of pride. People that have a problem with bitterness and rebellion and have the spirit of Jezebel inside of them. Eventually, God gives us a space and a time to repent. But if we are not careful, that space and time to repent is going to come and go. And then God is going to have to cut you out of the vine so that everybody else that is connected to the vine can live. That's why the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, 16 through 20, he says, You shall not know, or you shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. You are going to know the ones that are bearing good fruit, the ones that aren't bearing good good fruit. Because the one thing about God is your fruits will always find you out. You can try to hide them, and you can try to do it when nobody else is looking, but eventually your fruit will always find you out. There are fruit out there that look so good on the outside, but if you took a bite of it, you would die because they are full of poison, full of other things that can cause you to lose your life. So we need to be careful. Just because you're bearing fruit that looks good doesn't mean that it is good fruit. You have to bear not just good fruit. I'm not talking about inside and outside. You need to have a good personality. You need to have, just be a good person. Follow the commandments that God has. Because if we don't bear good fruit, then he says, if you're corrupt, I'm going to cut you off. I'm going to throw you into the fire. So we need to make sure that we're bearing good fruit. 1 John chapter 2, 19 says, And you know, some people who appear to be in Christ don't always abide in Him. 1 John 2, 19 says it this way, They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out in order that it might be shown that they are not of us. There are going to be people that you think are with you 100%. But there's going to be some that are going to say, hey, you know, I'm really not with you. I'm not, I don't really want to be a part of the mind. So that everybody that appears to be in Christ are going to be in Christ. Secondly, the second job of the husbandman is to constantly trim shoots from the fruit-bearing branches so that all the sap is concentrated on fruit-bearing. So pruning is not done only once, but it is a constant process. The Father prunes a branch so that it may bear more fruit. And after continual pruning, it bears much fruit. You know, I always go back to my dad because he always changes stuff in his garden, in his yard. And every year, I hear the same thing from my dad. I say, Dad, why do you keep doing this stuff over and over again? He goes, oh, Nick, I just got into a place and I, I just have to make it. That's my dad's classic line. If you ever, he's redoing a room in his house. All right, when this is done, all I got to do is just maintain. And then, you know, a couple weeks later, that room's demolished, and now I got to just maintain. I go in the backyard, and he's got a deck that, uh, you know, he'll redo and do over again. But his plants, he's, you know, we've got everything set up this way, and it looks very nice. It's fantastic. But then you go out there a few weeks later, and he's got the shovel out. He's picking up these flowers and putting them over here, and cutting this tree down, and pruning this, and trimming that. I'm like, what are you doing? He said, well, I've got to do this in order for the plants to grow. I've got to trim this and do that. And I'm like, man, that seems like a whole lot of work. A whole lot of work that I had to do as a child, that's why I don't do it now. But he does this every year so that it always gets the best possible nutrients and that it can always bear the fruit and the flowers that it is supposed to. Here's what happens with us. Our pruning comes by ways of trials and tribulations. You've got to understand that God knows what our strengths and our weaknesses are. But he wants us not just to, to sustain, but he wants us to constantly grow, and he wants us to constantly get better. 
And then we're all going to go through the times in our walk with God that we feel like He's abandoned us. Anybody ever felt that way? That God, God had left me? Sometimes I feel like Jesus, He's on the cross. He said, you know, Father, why have you forsaken me? I feel that way sometimes. But there are times that God does this. And it's part of the pruning process. And, all, you know, our automatic reaction is, if I'm going through this, then it's got to be the devil. If I'm going through this, then God doesn't love me. If I'm going to do this, then, you know, every other bad excuse in the world. But God allows certain things to happen in our lives to prune us and to, to test us and to get us to where he wants us to be. If you look at the story of Job, Job was tested probably more than any other person I could possibly think of. Loses his kid, loses his house, loses his animals, loses his servants. I mean, he had nothing, nothing. But when it was all said and done, because of the pruning process, because of the, the process that Job had to go through, he was able to not just get back what was taken, but he was able to get double what was taken back. What would have happened to Job had there not been a pruning process? What would have happened to him if God wouldn't have allowed the devil to tempt him and try him and put him through this tribulation? Would Job have received double? I don't, I don't think so. But because he was willing to go through that process, God would bless him far above what he ever thought. So pruning is necessary in our spiritual lives. The Father cuts out, he removes all the sins and everything that limits us from, or stops us from bearing fruit. So he proves us, he calls it with a wine, a wine dresser's knife. The thing with a knife, have you ever been cut with a knife? Sucker hurts, man. It hurts. You ever get cut? You know, you try to cut something and do this, and you slice your finger. Even a paper cut, man, you think, I did a paper cut, I still have a shot. It's, it hurts when you get cut. And then there's blood drawn, and then there's a point of having to mend the wound. What happens when God comes in with his knife, his spiritual knife, and he begins to look at our branch and say, hey, we've got these things shooting off that probably shouldn't be here. It's wasting energy. It's wasting time. So we need to cut that. We need to cut that little branch off that's sticking out because it's, it's wasting your potential. It's wasting your time and your energy. So he comes through with his knife and starts chipping away and stuff and hacking at it. So you, you start to feel like, why am I being cut? And why am I going through this? And why am I bleeding? Why, 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 God? Why is this happening? But you have to understand that the vine dresser or the husband it knows exactly what he's doing. And we have to understand that God knows exactly what he's doing. He knows what needs to be trimmed. He knows what needs to be cut out of our life. The thing is, sometimes we don't understand why it has to go. And we don't understand why we can't hang out with these people and why we can't do this and why we can't do that. But God said it's all part of the curve. I don't need you, I don't need you to understand. He said, I just need you to believe. I need you to believe in me. I need you to believe that I am not going to lead you astray. I'm not going to cut anything out of your life that doesn't need to be cut out. He said, you just have to trust in me because that plan is at the mercy of a husband. When my dad goes out into the garden with his scissors and starts cutting stuff, the plant doesn't get up and smack him in the face and say, what are you doing? You're not freaky if you did. When he comes out, I, I can just see it. If a plant can speak, when my dad walks out with those little hedgers and the scissors, I can see, oh, they can talk. You know, they talk about a toy story, talk about a plant story. My dad comes out and they're thinking, oh my God, we're dead. So he comes out there and starts hacking away. But what if that tree could uproot itself and just smack him right in the face? What if the plants could get up and just start yelling at him? You think it would make a prop? No, it doesn't work that way. That plant or that tree is at the mercy of the husband. It's at the mercy of the one that has the scissors. The mercy of the one that has the knife. We are at the mercy of God. And just the whole thing about surgery is God's not going to do any more than he needs to. He's not going to put any more on us than we can bear. We have to believe that with every trial, there's always a way of escape. Because sometimes it feels like we can't bear it. And sometimes we don't want to get flipped here. And we don't want to lose this. But God says, if you want to grow, and if you want to bear more fruit, then you have to sacrifice just a little bit more. You look at the great men and the great women of God. What is one thing that they all have in common? They all were willing to go through the pruning phase, and they were all willing to sacrifice everything that needed to be sacrificed in order to be to the place that God wanted them to be. 
We look at people like Lee Stone King and, and Brother Cisco and all these great men of God that even that live right now today. I'm not even talking about the ones that lived before. But the great men of God that are alive today. We say, how can you be used in that capacity? How can you see people raised from the dead? How can you lay hands on a tumor and it just falls off? How can you pray for somebody and their leg grows because it was six inches too short and now the legs had a normal length? And how can you lay hands on somebody who's paralyzed and then all of a sudden they have movement throughout their body? How can this happen? It's because they were willing to sacrifice more than everybody else was willing to sacrifice. They were willing to get pruned in places that some of us are not willing to get through. And some of us will never reach our potential in God because we are too afraid of what God is going to put out of our life. Some of us will never reach our potential in God because we're afraid of what God is going to ask us to give up and what God's going to ask us to cut out of our life. But then we sing the song, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. It's a little hypocritical. Part of that, it's a little hypocritical. We cannot say, God, if you can use anything, use me. God says, okay, I'm busting out the scissors. We say, God, I ain't doing that. I don't want to do, I mean, you know, I love Titus too much, but I don't like, God said, I don't want you hanging out with Titus. I said, you know what, I love Titus too much, so I'm going to keep hanging out with Titus. I'm never going to reach my potential because I am not willing to sacrifice. I'm not willing to let God cut that out of my life. If God tells you to, whatever God tells you to do, and I think there are people here today that God has spoken to that say, you need to start trimming things out of your life. And you need to start doing this and not doing this and saying this and not saying this and going here and not going here. And there's an inner struggle, I believe, with some here today that's saying, God, I don't, I don't understand. I don't want to do this. I'm not ready. And so God says, you're never going to reach your potential as long as you don't allow me to operate. As long as you don't allow me to prove. You're never going to be that vine or that branch. You're never going to be the branch that you want to be. You're never going to bear the fruit that God wants you to bear. You're never going to reach those people that you never thought you could reach. God says, it's in my plan. It's, it's part of that branch. But if you're not willing to give this up, then that part that's just hanging there is going to take away some of the energy that should be going to the other parts of the branch. And so you're never going to bear that fruit. But it's time that us as saints of God, we need to be honest with ourselves. And we need to be honest with God. And say, God, whatever, if you truly need it, God, whatever you want from me, that's what I'm going to do. Then today can be that day that you say, God, take out the scissors, take out the shears, and whatever you got to trim out of my life, God, I'm going to surrender it to you. Because you are the potter, I am the clay. You are the husband in, I am the mind. I'm tired of having control, God, and I'm just going to let go. I'm going to let you have your way. And I know it's going to hurt, and I know it's not going to be comfortable. And I may not understand, God, what you're trying to do in my life. But God, I trust you enough, and I love you enough, and I'm just going to lay there. I'm just going to say, God, do the work that needs to be done. If you're not satisfied where you are with God, let God prune you. If you're not satisfied with the work that you're doing, let God prune you. Because God will get you where you need to be. Pruning takes place in many forms. He may use sickness. He may use hardships. He may use loss of material possessions. It could be persecution. Or it could be you're getting made fun of by other people. It may be the loss of a loved one. It may be grief in a relationship. It may be a combination of all these things. But whatever tool God uses, it's not that he has left you. It's not that he has abandoned you. But he's pruning you to focus his energy and the anointing in this one area so you can bear more fruit. And you can live a spiritually healthy and a spiritually productive life. Hebrews chapter 12 and 6 says this. For those who the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he scourges every son whom he receives. So he allows things to happen. The pruning isn't because he doesn't love us. It's because he loves us. That's why we get pruned. That's why God does these things and allows these things to take place. Because he absolutely loves us. John 15, 3 says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Verse 5, you can come up. We're going to run out of time here in a moment, so I'll finish this later. But... Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. This is how God proves us. He uses the word of God. You know, I told you that husband used shears and he used a knife. Hebrews 4.12 says it this way. 
The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's why we need to have a relationship and be connected to the mind. You need to hear both the spoken word and the written word. Because that word is a two-edged sword. It's sharper. It pierces to the dividing of soul and spirit, the joints and the heart. And it discerns the thoughts and the intents of your heart. We need to get the word of God inside of us. That's why he uses preachers and teachers and evangelists and pastors and apostles and prophets. He uses the fivefold ministry to be able to prune, to be able to help the branches. That's why when an evangelist comes in, usually a revival follows. You have great growth and you have great, not just maybe not numerically, but spiritual growth because God uses that evangelist to come in and, and through the words that God speaks through him, begins to just prune and cut some things away. That's why before we ever enter into a revival, this church, we always take a week or two of prayer and fasting. Because we want God to already start pruning. We want God to already start doing a work. So that when the evangelist comes, it can be uplifting. We can get the full nourishment that God wants us to have. That's why, think about preaching it sometimes. If you ever come to church and you feel like the preacher minister is reading your mail, he knows what's going on. That's why it happens. Because God knows what you need to hear. And you may come to a service and you think, man, he's just full of smoke. I can know what he just said. Well, that service may not have been for you, but thank you for coming. But sometimes you're going to come to the house of God and it seems like that person is looking right at you. And he's talking right to you. Because God says, all right, now it's time to start cutting. Now it's time to be the person that God wants us to be. Let's all stand together here this morning.